welcome. I'm welcome number two. Uh, it's my absolute honor and privilege to stand before all of you, specifically all of you, uh, in the space that I and so many others call home. Uh, I totally recommend a home with a fully stocked bar. That's, my, that's rule number one. Rule number one. Uh, last year, I was also able to welcome you here, and I shared what we at Joe's Pub are thinking about in 2017. It was just post-election, pre-inauguration, and we were thinking about Joe's as not a performance space, but as a rehearsal space, a place where we could learn and grow communities, where we could think of our shows as opportunities for engaging these once-in-a-lifetime gatherings of humans in a room. And this year, uh, post-inauguration, pre-apocalypse, uh, we are recognizing that the audiences we are building are segregated, actually, into two distinct groups. And I don't think we're alone in this, but the two groups that we have noticed uh, are that we have white communities and mixed communities. Um, so here are the questions that we commit to challenging ourselves and our artists with going into this calendar year. What are the rooms where a whites only sign outside the door would cause no shift in the audience demographic or in the rehearsal? <laughs> what are the meetings, the design team gatherings where that sign or perhaps a men only sign could be hung with no shift? I think I can count on one hand the amount of bands or companies I work with regularly that are all women, all black, all Latinx, or all Asian but it would take both of my hands, and the hands of everyone in this room, I think, to count the all-male or all-white bands and companies I work with. Strange, no? Uh, often we talk about theater in terms of home and our chosen family. So who is in your family? Who did you invite into your home? Who did you choose? Who are you planning this revolution with? I hope that as we move into this year and into all of these conferences for this field of storytelling, we think about the signs that could be hung around the rooms we gather in. Because you may not see them, but they are seen, and they are telling their own very vibrant story. Thank you very much. Welcome. This seems to be the year of rebranding, uh, and it's my uh, pleasure to, uh, to uh, under the race, most uh, constant partner, Mario Garcia Durham, who's CEO of the Association of Performing Arts Professionals. All right, Mario, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. I did want to mention that Mark said the next year is the quinceanera anniversary and I have a beautiful, I'm older than he is, I have a beautiful quinceanera dress, I'm happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's gorgeous. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you all uh, for allowing me to speak for a few minutes. I want to congratulate Under the Radar for its continued success and partnership. Um, as always, we are delighted to have a symposium pre-conference so tomorrow from 9 and 9.30 until 12 at the Hilton. There will be uh, Under the Radar speed dating. And um, I wanted to just mention that when I talked to you last year, it was a few days before the inauguration, and luckily, all of my fears were unwarranted. <laughs> that exploded. Um, anyway, so after a long and eventful year, uh, the only advice I can offer to you is to stay focused. Uh, I firmly believe that, that daily bombs of indignation and things that are going to turn our heads um, are, are, are laying out for the media to gobble up and distract us. But please, please, please keep focused on the critical and important issues that, that affect us. There are a lot, and there's a lot going on in Washington in the background that we all need to pay very, very close attention to. So um, I wish you a wonderful event, and thank you all for letting me speak. Happy New Year. Now to keep things rolling along, we have come to the from where I stand portion of the event. Now, from where I stand is briefly brief views on the state of theater from unique perspectives of four guest artists. The first artist on our list today is playwright and screenwriter Robert Schenken. 
Roberts offered authored 15 plays and won a Pulitzer in two Tony Awards, and we actually went to, uh, he went to the other high school in Austin, Texas, the good high school. <laughs> I went to the Roper school, uh, and uh, we actually used to compete against each other in acting contests, which is the only way that uh, Texas can understand theater. <laughs> won once, <laughs> but then he went on to win a Pulitzer writing, so. Anyway, uh, please welcome Robert Schenken. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, before I uh, came up here, Ari Edelson whispered in my ear the helpful advice, don't fuck this up. <laughs> so with the bar set impossibly high, it's, uh, it is such a pleasure to be here today in this distinguished company of artists, rabble-rousers, and troublemakers. Um, in my personal calendar of the theatrical year, I think of the Radar Festival as Christmas. Because here, under the tannenbaum of the public theater, I'm always surprised and delighted by what I unwrap. Of course, outside this building, not all surprises delight. Fourteen months ago, a lifetime ago, in November 2016, the majority of citizens of the United States were surprised, shocked even, by a presidential election which threw an archaic electoral process that an extraordinarily dangerous demagogue into office while at the same time his party holds both houses of Congress, thus consolidating power in the hands of reactionary forces. Apologies to our foreign guests today, some of whom have extensive experience in working under similar conditions. We have much to learn from you. But the problem of Trump, while uniquely American, is not, alas, solely an American problem. The consequences of the nuclear dick slapping on the table between Trump and North Korea will not, in the end, respect national borders. And the United States, withdrawn from international efforts to control climate control, may indeed guarantee its failure. But hey, it's just the planet. <laughs> While our current political crisis is extraordinary, it is not new. The authoritarian playbook is centuries old. Create a constant state of crisis which only a strong leader can solve. Encourage fear. Divide the populace and scapegoat minorities and immigrants with appeals to nationalism, racism, and isolationism. Smear your opponents as unpatriotic and tell the press to just shut up and listen. Nor is this only an American issue. All the Western democracies are currently struggling with some variant. Five Star in Italy, the Freedom Party in Austria, Le Pen in France, Geet Wilders in Holland, etc., etc. The question, of course, is not so much what the authorities will do, but how we, the citizens, will respond. And indeed, 14 months ago, this is what frightened me the most and what keeps me up at night still. We have a long, sordid history in this country of race-baiting demagogues, but also a history of political heroes willing to stand up to them. Have you no decency, sir? But what has happened today? is that certain congressional leaders have temporarily shelved their allegiance to the Constitution in order to embrace a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to exercise complete power. We have seen how such temporary moral transactions played out in the past, and the results are not pretty. During the election, formerly responsible officials enabled this takeover with false self-serving assurances that it's just campaign rhetoric. He doesn't really mean it, or my personal favorite, it's just words. It's just words. Everybody in this room knows the atomic power of words. They are our stock and trade. And anybody outside this room who still thinks he doesn't mean it hasn't been paying attention, and that is the real danger. That is how democracies die. The real political coup is not the policeman at your door, truncheon in hand. That's the epilogue. It is the abdication by ordinary citizens of their personal moral responsibility to the dubious care of the state. If you do not pay attention, the unimaginable can become 
the inevitable. The theatrical argument for individual conscience versus government authority is also not new. We, my friends, are the inheritors of a noble tradition of resistance. Aeschylus made the case for it 2,000 years ago, and it's worth noting that his protagonist was a woman, played by a man in really high shoes. <laughs> Contemporary writers like Shoyinka, Parks, Havel, Fugard, Nottage, and many others frequently and eloquently make the same appeal, and this is necessary because the authoritarian virus never completely dies out. It lies quiescent in the body politic until times of anxiety and then reemerges to gorge vampire-like on our fear. The only cure, then and now, is alert, responsible citizenry. And this, my friends, is where we come in, the artists. The battleground here is the value of words, the very nature of truth, and the definition of community. Who are we as a people? Who is not us? At the end of the day, the battleground is over the narrative, over the story. And story is something we know a thing or two about. Shoyenka says that theater is the most revolutionary art form in part because it can respond immediately to the changing patterns of events. And this is what we must do. This administration is not business as usual. Indeed, they've thrown the rule book out the window. And theater artists cannot respond in traditional ways using our traditional models. Confronting this administration about a critical issue emerging today, but doing so only 18 months after the fact, is not a recipe for successful resistance. We have to respond with urgency. We have to think out of the box. By way of example, 14 months ago, in a fit of white-hot anger, I channeled my considerable fears of the then rough beast slouching towards Washington and wrote a play, Building the Wall, which pursues the pure logic of Trumpism to one tragic and very possible conclusion, sordid examples of which abound in our supposedly modern age. This theatrical provocation, this political cri de cure was designed to be performed as cheaply as possible, and my marching orders were no holdbacks. Get this done now, today. I don't care who does it, professional or rank amateur, or where they do it, Shea Stadium or a church basement. And since its first public performance in February of last year, it's had over 50 productions in this country, as well as performances in Mexico, Canada, Sweden, UK, Austria, and Iran. Rolling out a play in such a manner is challenging, and it demands, among other sacrifices, relinquishing the control an artist would normally insist upon. But the time is now, and we must all, each of us, in our own blessedly unique way, make a stand and resist. One of the first acts of every authoritarian regime is to come after the artists, especially the theater artists. This might seem contradictory, since they so often scorn us as elite, effete, and ineffectual. But the truth is, no other art form speaks truth so forcefully to power. No other art form is so capable of identifying and rousing the currents of unexpressed dissatisfaction roiling beneath the surface of society. And no other art form has such potential, and this is the key, my friends, no other art form has such potential to give hope to the opposition. That is why they fear us. Make sure they fucking do. Thank you. Building the Wall, I believe, is available, and it's, uh, it's great. It's a very powerful piece, and you can put it up in a couple minutes, so uh, take that. Um, thank you. Uh, now we're going to take a jump. Uh, I think one of our next speakers actually was running a rave in our lobby last night until about 1 a.m., so maybe she's... Uh, <clears throat> on our way here, but uh, it's my uh, delight to introduce you to uh, good. My delight to introduce you to Jess Tom.
and uh, she's a, a runs a company that's Tourette's Hero. And uh, let's see. Then we're going to um, well. I really like. I'm really honored to welcome Jess to the stage, and she'll tell you everything. Thank you. Bye -bye. Biscuit, to 
make a significant contribution to catalyzing social change. Biscuit. Biscuit. I'm not disabled by my body. Biscuit. For a long time, the consensus was that when thinking about disability, we followed either a medical or a charity model. Do you see a person as being disabled because their body or mind is impaired in some way? Both assume biscuit people, disabled people are in need of pity or cure. Biscuit. By contrast, the social model says people are disabled, biscuit people aren't disabled by their impairments, but by a failure in society to consider difference in how it is organised. For example, deafness is an impairment, but not having captioning or sign language interpretation is what can be disabling. Blindness is a visual impairment, but not having information in tactile or audio formats is disabling. And I am not disabled, Biscuit, by the ticks in my legs. Biscuit, my wheelchair provides me with a great way to get around. Biscuit, what I am disabled by is steps, a lack of ramps, or broken elevators. Biscuit, people are often nervous about calling me disabled because they view the term negatively. I don't see it that way at all. For me, saying I'm disabled acknowledges the barriers I face because of our collective failure to consider difference. Biscuit, biscuit, only if those barriers are acknowledged can they be changed. Biscuit, understanding disability, biscuit, using the social model, has been essential for shaping my view of my body and my experiences. Biscuit, it's the reason I say I am a disabled person rather than a person with a disability. Disability isn't something I carry around with me. Biscuit, and it's not a permanent, unchanging state. Biscuit, I am more or less disabled in different contexts. Biscuit, the exciting thing about this is that means by working together, we can create less disabling spaces, systems, and attitudes. Biscuit, my journey to the stage. Biscuit, as I'm sure you've noticed by now, Biscuit, having Tourette's, Biscuit, means I'm rarely still or quiet. Fuck it, bang! Biscuit, I've got a crack cocaine in my pants and a, pe and a pizza. <laughs> I have neither of those things in my pants. Biscuit, 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 tips. Biscuit can turn ordinary tasks like making a cup of tea or chopping vegetables into extreme sports. Biscuit, biscuit. And they're often the first thing people notice about me. As a teenager, I used to love going to theatres and galleries. But the more my movements and noises made me stand out, the harder I found it to go. And I'm not alone. Back in 2014, when I started work on my first stage show, Backstage and Biscuitland, I googled Tourette's Theatre. And nearly all the top results were accounts of people with tics being asked to leave or sit separately. Biscuit. I created Backstage in Biscuitland after a particularly distressing experience at a theatre in London, Biscuit, where I was asked uh, Biscuit to move and sit in the sound, the sound booth halfway through the show because of the noises I was making. This experience was deeply distressing. Biscuit. As I sat sobbing in the sound booth, I promised myself that I would never set foot in another theatre again. Biscuit. Thankfully, that wasn't a promise I kept. <laughs> Instead, I decided to occupy the one seat in the house I knew I wouldn't be asked to leave. <laughs>
This might include people with intellectual disabilities, dementia, movement disorders, those on the autistic spectrum, people with young children, babies, or just those with very loud laughs. Biscuit, biscuit, biscuit. When they're done right, they give the whole audience permission to relax, move about and make noise. This fosters a more exciting theatrical experience for everyone. Biscuit. There's so much amazing work out there, I don't want anyone to miss out because of preconceptions about who it's for or how it should be enjoyed. Biscuit. You shouldn't have to take to the stage just to feel safe from discrimination. Biscuit. Finally, Biscuit. visibility matters. While cult cultural spaces are generally getting better at thinking about access for audiences, there are still many stages that I can't get on because of both physical and attitudinal barriers. Biscuit, Biscuit, many folk, Biscuit, Biscuit. We've toured Biscuitland across the UK and internationally, and over half the, the theatres we visited were, weren't accessible to me in the same way as my non-disabled peers. Biscuit, disabled artists aren't just being written out of physical spaces. We're rarely visible within mainstream venues, productions and programmes. All too often, our stories are written and performed by non-disabled people. In the UK, we call this cripping up. Biscuit. Mimicking impairments doesn't constitute diversity, and it reinforces damaging stereotypes. Biscuit. When discussing diversity in the UK's Parliament, British actor Idris Elba gave a powerful speech. He said, diversity in the modern age is more than just skin colour. It's gender, age, disability, sexual orientation, social background, and most important of all, diversity of thought. He went on, talent is everywhere, but opportunity isn't. And this gets right to the heart of the issue. Biscuit. If you're not white, male or non-disabled, you're likely to face significant barriers within the creative sector. Barriers that exist within wider society. Unchecked, this lack of diversity becomes self-perpetuating. If you don't see yourself represented on stage, you're much less likely to think that performing is a possibility for you. There are still too many people who don't see themselves reflected on stage or screen, biscuit, or within our cultural institutions. This is bad for the industry and bad for us all. Biscuit, biscuit. All this got me thinking about the cultural curation that happens around disability and the work that is and isn't made accessible. It led to our most recent production a neurodiverse presentation of Samuel Beckett's short play, Not I. In this intense play, a disembodied mouth in a darkened room biscuit, blurts out her entire life story at top speed. Biscuit. Our aim is to take a piece of work traditionally seen as being difficult and make it accessible at every level. We want to show that with the right approach, even the most challenging texts can become accessible. We're claiming Mouth as a disabled character and understanding her experiences from that perspective. Biscuit, Biscuit, Biscuit. Our intention is to present a rigorous performance of the work, but in a way that works for my mind and body. My challenge to you. I'd like to leave you with three challenges for this festival and beyond. Biscuit. Practice everyday inclusion. As a sector, it is our responsibility to provide resources that can dismantle barriers. Don't let fear of getting it wrong prevent you from even starting. Making art accessible isn't a task that will ever be completed. It's an ongoing process that we must all engage with every day. Nurture unpredictable outcomes. When we started Tourette's Hero, we had no idea how other people would respond. And simply acknowledging the humour of Tourette's felt risky. Since then, it's evolved in ways I could never have imagined. Biscuit. And most of the, ex the most exciting developments have been unplanned. Challenge yourself to be open to trying new experiences, even if they might fail. Being receptive to the unexpected can lead to incredible outcomes. 
Finally, collaborate, innovate and improve. Creative collaboration across disciplines it can unlock new ways of thinking, capturing imaginations and expand engagement. Take opportunities to celebrate and share good practice, but never stop asking what you could be doing better. So in conclusion, for a dynamic, robust and representative sector, it's essential for, to invest in inclusivity for audiences, for artists and for industry leaders. Biscuit, ketchup, biscuit, biscuit. Disability isn't a niche issue. Statistics from the World Bank estimate that one-fifth of the global population is disabled. Biscuit. So there is a strong business case as well as social imper uh, imperative for investing in access. Visibility matters because art and culture are great at shifting thinking. But it's essential that people with lived experience take the lead. Biscuit. In March, Tourette's Zero is celebrating its eighth birthday. Biscuit. And in that time, the most important thing I've learned is this. If something isn't working, I have the capacity to change it. And that's not because I have any biscuit special qualities or superpowers. Biscuit. It's because we all have the ability to create change. Whenever you're thinking about the barriers you want to bring down, it's busy, and let's face it, there are some pretty big ones at the moment. It's worth thinking about what you want to create, cultivate, and protect at the same time. Changing the cultural landscape isn't too mighty a task, and it's definitely not something we should just leave to politicians or people wearing capes. It's something we can all do. Biscuit. 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 Together we can create opportunities for talent to be shared, for difference to be visible, and for creative communities to lead the way in shaping sustainable social change. If you'd like to find out more about Tourette's Zero, please visit our website or come and find me later. I'll be the one shouting biscuit. Thank you very much.
forget the first day when you <laughs> embrace me. <laughs>
amazing show, Shasta Goes Pop, uh, which played last night, uh, and if anyone was there dancing, it, she turns this whole lobby into a club, and we're going to do that again on Friday night, so I really hope you can be there then. It's quite an amazing experience to be in the presence of the Shasta. So, um, and so, and Charlotte's been directing here, uh, she's kind of one of our in-house under the radar directors. So uh, you'll see her work down the line. So thank you. Um, now it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce uh, Andrew Kircher. Now Andrew Kircher is, I call him my uh, consigliere. He is the dramaturg for the festival, uh, to some extent. He doesn't take responsibility for everything I book, but he, the things he likes, he helps me out. Uh, and he's with the, the New Works Department, which is a whole new thing that the, under the, that the public theater is doing, which is they created a New Works Department, which includes literary and musicals and all the other things that we're doing, all this theater that we're making, including devised work. And that's where Andrew comes in. He's been uh, helping us with the coming attractions. And uh, I leave it to Andrew Kircher. Thank you. Um, 
So first I'll second what Mark said. What Charlotte Brethwaite and uh, Aisha Jordan are making in the lobby is sheer brilliance. And I encourage you all to come on Friday. It's a really good time. But right now we, uh, we have four wonderful coming attractions. The way it'll work is I'll introduce the artist, they'll come up, they'll share a little bit of what they're working on, and then we'll have time afterward for questions from all of you. Uh, and we're gonna begin with Sinking Ship Productions and a hunger artist. Please welcome them to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome. In the last few decades, interest in public starvation has declined dramatically. <laughs> it, it used to be that a hunger artist in top form would attract enormous crowds everywhere he went, but uh, we live in a different world now. You cannot see a real hunger artist today, but uh, here, perhaps, with our minds and with our hearts, we can resurrect one of the greatest men ever to be seen on this stage. Here it is. The hunger artist. So that's a little taste <laughs> of our show. Thank you. Thank you. It is a solo adaptation of a Kafka short story, and uh, 
And, and it starts just like you saw, with a miniature recreation of the whole hunger artist spectacle before, in a magical reversal, the audience is thrown back in time to the heyday of the hunger artist before his eventual decline, where he is forgotten in a circus. Uh, the show has a lot of humor, but there's also a tragic dimension to it, and it asks the question, what is the value of performance, why do we do it, and why do we go and see it? Uh, Hunger Artist is created by Sinking Ship Productions. That's me, Josh Luxemburg, and John Levin. Uh, we founded the company in 2008 with There Will Come Soft Rains, which was a Time Out Critics pick, and followed it up with Powerhouse at the New Ohio Theater, which was a New York Times Critics pick, and the script was also a finalist for the Eugene O'Neill Conference. Uh, now, I'm the writer on these projects, and John and I create every piece collaboratively working together from the very beginning. And we brought on for this project Josh Gell, who is an amazingly inventive director and also a specialist in 19th century theater. His last production, uh, The Black Crook, was a reimagining of America's first musical at Abrams Arts Center. Uh, now, with uh, A Hunger Artist, uh, which is a story about a lost art form, uh, we evoked uh, a lot of older theatrical techniques. Now, John is, uh, he graduated from the Lecoq School in Paris, uh, so uh, the piece has a sort of highly heightened physical theater style. Uh, it's a bridge between uh, well, narrative theater and experimental theater. And, uh, well, it's bleak, it's Kafka, but it's excessively bleak. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, basically the true draw, draw though, is, is John's virtuosic performance. I mean, he is conjuring multiple characters, switching seamlessly between them, uh, while manipulating Victorian miniature uh, theaters, uh, puppets, he's clowning, uh, and there's a little bit of magic. Uh, so the New York Times uh, said that John holds the audience in the palm of his hand, a New York Irish Arts called it uh, solo tour de force. Levin is like a cross between Will Eno and, this is a lot, Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> uh, we started working on the piece three years ago. We uh, did our first workshop at the New Ohio Theater, and then we premiered at the Connolly Theater. Uh, and from there, we jumped on a plane, and we took the show to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, where we received a sort of absurd number of stars, and were granted the Lustrum Award for Excellence. And right now, we are remounting for this short week through Tuesday, and we really hope you'll get a chance to see the show. We're, uh, these are the dates uh, that we're performing this week. And uh, we are setting up tours in uh, 2018, 2019, domestically and internationally, starting in just two weeks in Hartford, Connecticut, with Heartbeat Ensemble. And uh, well, we're looking to add more dates. So this is actually the first show that we've built specifically to tour, which means we're meeting a lot of you for the first time here today. We really look forward uh, to building partnerships for this project and for our future projects as we go. Um, I'll tell you a few logistics. It's about 75 minutes long, and there's no intermission. Uh, it fits best into proscenium spaces or black boxes with equivalent setup, which really helps us with the stage magic, and uh, sits in houses of about up to 250 people. Uh, we travel with four, and everything fits in the back of a minivan or on one pallet if we're shipping. We're also developing uh, several new projects, and uh, if you are the sort of place that can offer residency space or other development resources, we'd love to talk to you about that as well. And so, once again, this is our schedule for this week, there it is, uh, with uh, suitably strange times because we know you're busy and so it's been scheduled for your convenience. Uh, so again, just thanks to Mark and Andrew for inviting us to be here today. We will be in the, at the bar in the lobby ready to answer any questions, so thank you all. <laughs> We're also ready to answer some questions now. Sure. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, can we get the house lights up? Any questions for the company? Not a one. There is a, one there. of the shows tomorrow at 3 p.m. at the Connolly? Uh, tomorrow at 4 at the Connolly. And at 10. Oh, and at 10 p.m., yeah. Thank you. Great. Anything else? Done so, yeah. Nothing. You can even just ask about their daily life, their hobbies, their fears, their hopes for the future. That's okay. Well, with that, I want to thank them again for coming and sharing their work. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Mark.
Uh, next, we're going to welcome to the stage the team uh, with Primer for a Failed Superpower. So please join me in welcoming them to the stage. You can keep clapping because they need your encouragement, your excitement. Yeah, yeah, here we are. How are you doing? Associate Director of Primer for Pilt Superpower. And my name is Nehemiah Luckett, and I am the Music Director. And I'm Jill Friedkin, a founding member of the team, a company whose mission it is to make new performance works about America today. Our director, Rachel Chapkin, is away for work, but she'll be back on Sunday if you want to catch it. Hi, I'm Maddie Burson. I am the interim producing director of the team and line producer on Primer for a Failed Superpower. Um, we did Primer for two nights last August in Brooklyn, and we're here today to talk to you about touring. And you just saw an excerpt of my reimagining of Exumo's 22nd century as performed by our incredible company. Uh, I'm one of nine composers commissioned by the team to reimagine an iconic protest song for this concert. Other composers include Martha Redbone and Stu and Heidi Rodewald. And the songs range widely from, uh, from Smells Like Teen Spirit to the labor anthem, Which Side Are You On, to a medley that we called Queer Jubilance. And as music director, I led our massive band of 33 teenagers, 30-somethings, and baby boomers. During the concert, video interviews with activists from across the country are interspersed with songs, including a 21-year-old indigenous water protector from Standing Rock, and a cultural worker who has spent his entire life fighting for social justice in Appalachia. And we ended the concert with a pizza party, at which audience members were introduced to local activists and opportunities to get involved in their community. So we did this concert at a music venue in Brooklyn, and if you can't tell from the video, it was hot, like 100 degrees hot, and totally packed, and it felt incredibly medicinal and transformative to, I think, everyone in the room. And that was the aim of the whole project. Every day, I left rehearsals feeling like a better human and fired up for the justice work ahead. So, I imagine you're asking yourselves, how can this thing possibly tour? Well, uh, we're excited to tell you that there are a lot of different mo possible models, and we're excited to work with you to build one that is powerful, authentic, and doable. First and foremost, we are interested in, do in doing this a lot because we believe it's important. And if you want to put the whole New York production on a bus and bring us to your venue, that's possible. That said, we know getting all of us on a bus is expensive and complicated. So to tour this work, we're also imagining models much like 600 Highwaymen's The Record or Gob Squad's Before Your Very Eyes, um, meaning that a small group of us will work with you and your staff to build this ensemble locally through a series of short site visits and then be on the ground full time for the final rehearsal period and performances, which for our Brooklyn production totaled two weeks. Now, as Orion said, the highest intention of this work is to manifest co 
collective liberation through every facet of the project. We hung banners over the doors to the venue that read, how we make is as important as what we make. The most vital factor in all of this is the ensemble. How the ensemble is built is central to the vision for this work as an artistic avenue for deep community engagement whenever and wherever this piece is done. This was our ensemble last August. And here are some of the ways we found them. Word of mouth, singing and collaboration workshops that were free and open to the public, and key relationships with organizations doing justice and liberation work, particularly with teenagers and folks over 60. We're not here to tell you that this process is not complex, but we would work very closely with you and your artistic and engagement staffs to put together your ensemble. And there's a lot of space for varying levels of singing and performance experience, as long as each age group has just a few ringers. <laughs> at Roulette in Brooklyn. The show's definitely a concert, and it's going to feel best in a venue where people can both stand and sit. It could happen in a concert venue, or in a school gym, or in a church. The only requirement is a good sound system. We're in talks with a couple of partners in Washington, D.C. and the Pacific Northwest about bringing Primer to them in the summer of 2019. And we are even talking to a partner in London about the possibility of commissioning new reimaginings of British protest songs. All of which is to say that we would love to work with you. We think this project is particularly suited for summer programming because of the school calendar. And we have multiple budget templates ready to go for all of the models we just talked about. Um, what we need from you is excitement about bringing this work to your venue and the capacity for collaborating with us to build an ensemble. Primer is a forum for building community, deepening relationships, and joyfully exercising muscles for the ongoing fight for justice and liberation. Thank you so, so, so much, and we'll take your questions now. <laughs> of presenters um, across the country and perhaps around the world who are excited about um, the mission and the vision of a project like this. Um, what we found making the piece um, in Brooklyn is that uh, so much of what makes it valuable to the people who are doing it is what comes out of the room. Um, so we don't have any sort of pretty kind of packaged um, ideas about what that could look like, um, but we're certainly excited to, to explore that and kind of use the opportunity of touring it to build that uh, primer community around the world. Um, I'll also mention that we had a really robust and wonderful social media presence um, uh, as we were building the concert, and perhaps uh, Orion and Nehemiah and Jalen might want to talk a little bit about what we were doing in rehearsal and what we were sharing on the internet and um, the kind of impact that had, because I think that'll be a huge component of what it looks like to um, build a primer community that's bigger than Brooklyn. Just to say, speak really quickly to what happens immediately after the concert, as you know from being there, we invite these activists and organizers onto the stage and not only ask them to tell us about their work, but ask uh, them to uh, ask the audience what we can do right now in this moment to help their cause or their organization, which varied from go over to that table and sign up for our mailing list to passing a bucket around and put whatever money you got because that's what we need to more long-term organized ways of working together. And I think that would be very specific to the towns in which Primer may come to. And it is primarily, as you are referencing, a schematic for engagement. That, like, the, the particular schematic that we have built, um, we're excited to, to share. And are we still making a casebook? 
actually. Yeah. Because the, we learned so much in this process. It's very, uh, just so, so much learning on every level. And so um, at the very least, um, to, to be able to, like, to share stories from our community and what we learned that other people may even build um, whatever, whatever they're building from the ground up based on what we've learned. Great. Uh, time for probably one more question. Yes, right there. Uh, how many people do you need at a minimum in a choir, and what's the largest that you need? Um, do I? Uh, <laughs> what, yeah, um, so I, thinking through the songs that we have and kind of the, uh, the breadth of just uh, parts and things, our production was probably a minimum, so I would say 30, 30 people um, would be, um, you have more to say. <laughs> no, I, I really don't want to cut you off. No, 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 no. I, I'm excited, I would be excited to discover what the maximum is. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Great. Well, thank you so much. And now, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage, Universes. but knows she wants to be down. Her virginity, M.I.A., she would say, stolen by her mother's pet dog, or was it a snake that comes to pluck the apple night after night, but does not take a bite. It just burrows his way inside where he thinks it is soft and warm. He huffs and puffs and blows down her walls, a torn Ado, turning her white slip as ruby red, like the twister that picked up Annie Hemp's house and turned Dorothy around and around in the air. Slow East Side, we perform. We started in like the open mic scenes, New York and Poets Cafe, PS122, PS122. Sorry, I gotta say it. Um, uh, New York Theater Workshop, we were here with our show in Merrillville. Uh, we've been to the Humana Festival. Uh, I played Party People, which was premiered at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, Berkeley Rep, and was here last year about the Black Panthers and the Young Lords. Um, and we want to introduce to you our new show, Unison, which is based on and inspired by the poetry of August Wilson. Now, a couple of years ago, not a couple of years ago, 1995, I saw August Wilson read poetry in a venue, um, in a venue in Pittsburgh, and I never forgot that this man who everybody knew as a playwright was reading this poetry. 
jumped to some years later. We got access to this poetry, a whole box of stuff written on the back of napkins and menus. We went through the poetry and inspired by all that, came up with this piece of artistic vision. <laughs> so Jordan, please let the audience see a little bit of unison. to his young apprentice, and when she opens up the box, all of his terrors pop out of the box. And it's about legacy and what we pass down from generation to generation, and also what have we dealt with or not dealt with our own personal shit that we, and secrets that we have hidden in pockets and corners. Um, like Steve said, we were able to look at some of August Wilson's unpublished poetry, I have that privilege, and uh, one of his poems talked about finding these terrors and what they might be. They actually were just one-line descriptions that we created whole characters out of. And um, then he also talked about a box. The crazy thing about it was that at the same time that we're reading this poetry, we're sitting behind, in front of a box full of gifts that the world has yet to see. So we were able to take that poetry and kind of just bring it into our own bodies and our own selves, mix it up with our own experiences, our own poet mentors, our own songs and just flip all of that and kind of combine hopefully what August was trying to say and what we received from him as a new generation. Um, that's what Unison is about. So we're looking for, now I gotta get the business aspect. <laughs> we're looking for um, a, a partner to, to redevelop and help launch the reproduce the show and then take the show out on the road and tour because we like to be out on the road and touch people and have people see and, and interact with us. Um, nine actors. So, Hamlet, it's nine actors. Um, but we would love to be able to take this show out on the road and really kind of beyond just, and this is just us and both, for those of you who know universes, beyond just doing the show itself in the traditional theater spaces, we go out and open mics, hip hop spots, or wherever it is, and we like to interact and, and, and really connect with folk while we're out. Yeah. So, yeah. We definitely have a big educational component that goes along with this, um, and we'd love to share that all with you guys. Yeah. Okay, we did it. Maybe you have some questions. Yeah. Questions for universities. Yeah. yeah, right there. I have a lot of questions that I will hopefully get an opportunity to ask you guys mm -hmm. at some point this weekend. But mainly what I wanted to say right now is that I saw a piece, and for people who are interested or curious about um, the experience of it, it has the kind of rangy jazz quality that universes has with in relation to the tent material. Also, Robert O'Hara's direction also yes. is also rangy and, and cracked open in a jazzy <laughs> kind of way. Yes. And it's very adult and very powerful. And I think this piece has been created in a regional theater setting and really now needs presenters to get involved together to figure out how do we liberate this extraordinary work that they've done from the way it came to be in a different system to get it into our system. And so I'll, I'm going to take time this weekend to talk
talk with you guys about what that means. Um, and I'd be happy to talk to more people about what we talk about or talk with others if you're interested in the piece. Thank I think you. it's really worth digging after, and it's going to need some digging to figure out how does it move between these two worlds. So it sounds like we have a lead partner. Does anyone else <laughs> Like you guys saw, there's a giant monolith wall in the bit, the, the floor. That does not tour with the with the production, and also there were lots of screens on the wall. We're obviously talking about you know just shrinking the body politic of the piece in that visible in that visual way, just shrinking it down a little bit. We have all of the um, all the props are uh, being boxed, and all of the um, the costumes are also boxed. So basically, we would just need. Uh, to mold into the next space, you know? What's the next space gonna be? Is it is it just the box? Is it the, what's the monolith look like? Or what's the body of um, the physical August Wilson gonna look like in whatever space it moves to? Any more questions? <laughs> How many of you tour? Um, nine. <laughs> and um, probably two tech people, yeah. uh, folk. Yeah, obviously it's all contingent on people's schedules and what is available, right? And what can happen, what cannot happen in people's lives. But there's some flexibility, but there are nine um, roles. Any other questions out there? Oh, great. Well, thank you. Thank you. As Martha Graham Cracker would say, last but not least, we have <laughs> Joseph Keckler. Please welcome Joseph to the stage. Well, actually, we'll begin. We'll see him again. as an 80-minute theater piece and more loosely as a musical endeavor. 
performed with a three-piece ensemble. This piece centers around the 2012 apocalypse that didn't happen, at least not so tidily and punctually, and extends into other realities that never came to be, perhaps one where there's a different president, perhaps one where I got the tattoo I thought about getting. Combining vocal work with observations and stories, I will lead the audience through a connected series of vignettes, each like a stop on a late night train, working towards a poetics of the non-event, the vitality of the lost cause, the evaporating expectation, and the longing for a dramatic ending. I, I got through that fast. This is like fading down. Oh. Prototype in here, um, and I are looking for co-commissioners, presenting partnerships, um, looking for touring partners for this and other work. The piece uh, also doubles as a recording project, and I'd like to collaborate with music producers, find means to promote and distribute work in a musical realm. And uh, to, to end, uh, here is a little sketch an excerpt that will become part of that larger work. And um, I'm sorry, hopefully I can, I can actually, you know, it's very, quite early. Um, the great singer Shali Alpin said that he didn't spit before noon. And um, I am of that school. But we will try. But imagine, you know, um, fog rising. <laughs> Do you remember the 2012 apocalypse? It was big in 2008. <laughs> 12, 21, 12. I had friends who were into it, but they'd all long since forgotten by the actual date. 2008 was when various shysters started selling their books about the end of the world by invoking some inscrutable Mayan prophecy, cobbled together with bits of scientific jargon about the magnetic pole switching, along with some other very distressing and probably accurate statistics about the environmental catastrophe we would all soon face. I had friends who went around Brooklyn muttering forebodingly about the day the world was to go asunder, 12-21-12. Then these same people spent the next four years squeezing in every hedonistic life experience they could possibly imagine and never mentioned the apocalypse again. As that date approached, some of them were even Christmas shopping. And I didn't get the sense that they were relieved the world wasn't going to end. No, I got the sense that they were somehow resigned to this fact. I thought, why? Although we were afraid of dying, I know we all so longed for it. Now we all can blame. we wanted but did not get the apocalypse we wanted but did not not get the apocalypse we wanted the apocalypse we wanted
just to leave him. Yeah. That's right. I was going to let you go. Um, any questions? Thank you. 